Welcome to Triangle B and I. Today's show is brought to you by Simply Done Concierge. Uh, folks, we talk all the time that we can't be in two places at once, but with the professional team at Simply Done Concierge, you actually can. Uh, they can come by your house, do meal prep, do some packing, some unpacking, some dog sitting, run some errands, take care of all that while you're out doing what else, the other things you need to be doing. You'll go to simplydoneconcierge.com. Tell us how we can help you. I know we'll be able to make you more productive during the day. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Manning. Each week on Triangle B&I, we bring you a local small business success story. If you are not familiar with BNI, it is Business Networking International, the world's largest networking organization. Our little slice of heaven here in the triangle is Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, and the surrounding towns. And each week, 32 chapters and about 550 members get together to help each other grow our businesses. And every now and then, we like to go visit our friends in the coastal region, where there's four chapters, about 127 members have two core groups getting ready to start. So uh, we always like checking in with them, see what life at the beach is like. And today our local small business success story is David Usher. He is the president and CEO of CMIT Solutions of Wilmington. David is in the Wilmington Connect chapter. They meet Thursday mornings at 845 at Wrightsville Beach Brewery in Wilmington. So if you were ever in that area, you want to meet some very successful sales professionals, and small business owners, please go by and visit. David, good morning. How are you? How's life at the beach today? Good morning. It's a beautiful day. It's very sunny. Um, See, we, uh, yep, yeah, we, for those of us that don't live at the beach, uh, we know that it's wonderful days. You love living at the beach. We assume everybody who lives at the beach goes to the beach every day, but not quite the case. But the good news is, you can go when you want to. <laughs> we do. And we, we do a lot of little little trips in the afternoon. You know, if it's a beautiful evening or a rainstorm's coming or something, go down to the beach and enjoy the, you know, enjoy the clouds. Are you guys paddle boarders or kayakers or skiers, anything like that? We're real big small boat sailors. We race um, lasers, sunfish, um, flying scots. 420s, all the small two, one to two man boats. And we race pretty much around the Southeast and sometimes even right. around the country. Very good. All right. So David's nine to five job, amongst other things we're going to get to is uh, he's been over nine years uh, uh, leading CMIT Solutions of Wilmington. It is listed as managed IT solutions, which is a big word, a big phrase. But at the end of the day, he protects your stuff. And David, when I meet folks like you and talk, one of the first things that comes up, comes to my mind lately is cybersecurity. And we hear all the time, oh, the, I have two employees. I don't have much money. Nobody's going to attack me, but we got to be on the lookout, don't we? You know, we, we do. Um, even though you may feel that you're small, or maybe you don't have a lot of value to, to add to somebody. Really what your value may be is that you may be a gateway to a larger company. Uh, if you remember back a few years ago, Target got hacked. Um, that hack occurred with an HVAC company that was a very small company, and they felt like you know, they didn't have a lot to worry about. And the hackers got in through their system, used their credentials into the larger system, and then worked their way through um, target. And that was a multi-billion dollar, wow. uh, impact. Wow. Yeah. And we never think of that. We, yeah. As a, as a client, right. If we're a target customer or a whatever customer and, and we do business with them online and buy something online, we never think that that's a gateway in. And I know you could shout that from the mountaintop, couldn't you? Right. Absolutely. And the other thing is, is just your, your personal information and your connections. Um, the, the way most uh, uh, hacks or breaches occur these days, uh, you got one side, which is brute force, but the other is the, the human side. And the human side is basically finding relationships and weaknesses in your defense through your relationships. So your information is also important because who your friend groups are, 
how you interact with each other, that information can be then used to try to spoof or try to fish you into uh, re releasing your, your credentials or something even more. Yeah. And we never think of that. And here's something I learned probably maybe a couple of years ago, B and I's taught me a lot of things and in certain industries I've learned from, and yours is one of them that when we apply for something online and we're setting up an online presence, there's those go-to questions they ask us that are a hacker's delight. Your mother's maiden name, the high school you went to your first pet's name, because we, a lot of us use those as passwords, don't we? Yeah, we do. And so here's a tip to, to get away from all that. Regardless of what the question is, provide your own answer. And just know that those are your own answers. Really? Sure. So my mother's maiden name is my first dog's name. <laughs> and so once again, I don't care what the question is being asked of me. <laughs> I don't know if this is how I do it is I just have my own. Oh. And so that's totally not related because so much of that information is out there. I mean, how many times have you seen a Facebook post where it's list 30 different questions and it's like, what yeah. high school did you attend? Yeah. What's your mascot? Who's your favorite teacher? All of that is, a, is an opportunity for um, AI to come smash your, your data together and figure out how to, how to, you know, compromise your, your computers, your email. And yeah. Email is really the big thing. Yeah. And that's another question I wanted to ask you because I'm sure a lot of people in the business world get these phishing emails from potential vendors. Like me as a business coach, I get a lot of emails from people. I have no idea who they are. Hey, Mike, we can guarantee you 30 qualified leads over the next 90 days if you purchase our program. Uh, I just delete those because I have no idea what I'm clicking on. Yeah, you really, you really can't happy click. Uh, no. you, uh, I, if somebody sends me an email and it doesn't have an address and a telephone number as well, I, I ignore it immediately. Ooh, if it has that information, then if it's something that interests me, I might call the number. Uh, the, the secret is, is really not necessarily clicking on the link. Yep. It is, if, if Amazon's telling you your password has changed, log into Amazon directly and they will advise you that way. Um, you know, if your bank yep. has a problem with your credit card, they're not going to send you a link to log in to then verify yep. yourself. Yeah. But the funny thing is, is it's really easy to talk about it. Like right here, uh, we offer one of the things we do is security awareness training for our customers. And basically once a month they get a spoof or a phishing email and we try to trick them into clicking it. And they also get a, a training session as well with that. And um, my guy over the holidays on a Friday night sent me a fake uh, Amazon email and I'm lying on the couch watching TV <laughs> and you know, <laughs> I clicked it because I had all kinds of stuff coming. And of course, the screen popped up and said, hey, this was, you know, not legit. And so it happens to all of us, uh, but it happens because of you get so busy in life. You know, sitting in front of a computer right now, it's easy. But when you're on your phone, you're in your car, you stop at a light, you look, you hit something. Those are the things that you got to have to remember that um, you just have to slow down just a little bit. What was, then, yep. oh, no, you finish. I was going to say, but there are also some, some tools that will really help you um, on security. And the most important tool that I have found is multi-factor authentication or yep. um, two-factor authentication. And it's something you have and it's something you know. And basically, even if your credentials get compromised, there's a roadblock that's, or a speed bump, if you will, that slows down the hackers because they have to get through two levels. Okay. I like that. The other thing I'd heard before is, and I, I think I could only do this on my computer. There's no way I could do it on my phone, but I'm sure there's a way is to hover over the email, their email address. And it could show something different, even though we know what we're reading, that their email could be something different hidden somewhere. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, you can call your email account, anything you want to, so that when it, displays on somebody's email, it will show whatever name. 
but if you hover over the link, it will then show you the actual address. And you can oftentimes uh, see, like say you're in an organization and you get a, an email from the owner asking you to buy a gift card. It'll say the owner's name, but then you hover over it and it's just some random Gmail account. You know that that's not legit. Yep. Also, there's, there's spam filters that you can use. And one of the, the, the next really good thing to do is any external emails should get flagged. So if you get an email from your boss, it should not show as an external source. And once again, that's a way to try to help you to determine and weed out what's legit and what's not. Interesting. Okay. So you hover over the link yep. for the email to see it, but also if you have a good spam filter, that it will tell you anything that comes externally. And then that way, you know, hey, wait a minute, this is not from the inside of our organization. If I am John Q. Public, which I am, how in the world do I go about setting up a really good spam filter? That's a good question. <laughs> or where do I go? <laughs> Other than you, if I didn't know you, who would I call? What would I do? So if you have your email through Microsoft, mm -hmm. there's an advanced threat module, ATM, oh. uh, and you can, you can enable that. And then through that module, you can put on the various spam filters and flags and things like that. And, and that's highly recommended. Our clients would use us and we would either use the Microsoft or there's some other third party tools that we use as well. Okay. But if you're just doing it yourself, Microsoft does have a an, an add-on to the email, and Google has something as well. Okay, yeah, mine's a G. Mine's through G. My work one is through Gmail, so I'd go to Google and kind of browse browse around their site and look for an upgrade of what I have. Right to to turn Excellent. on your on, on your spam filter. Excellent. But once again, the first thing you need to make sure is that your multi-factor authentication is yep. turned on. Yep. and that's in everything you do in life. And I can remember a couple of years ago, I would curse the multi-factor authentication and having to look at my phone and all that. Yeah. We now say thank you. Yeah. And, and it's fascinating. If I can, I'll go down the rabbit hole for one second. If you're a Harry Potter fan, in Harry Potter, they can change their, their looks and so that sometimes they can't tell who's whom. Mm -hmm. And if you'll notice, one of the things they do is they do multi-factor authentication. So when they stand up to each other, they point their wands at each other and they say, what is the last thing I said? Oh. Or somebody else said. So that's something you have and something you know. And um, uh, just think of Star Wars. If Star Wars had multi-factor authentication turned on, uh, would have the plans to the Death Star been found? Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. Um, <laughs> that's a good one. I wasn't expecting that answer, but you're right. I get it. And so once again, and, and there, there are some weaknesses in it, but the, the, end of the, the, the end of the line is, is that it's better than nothing. Yep. And I can tell you stories of people who have been hacked that I know personally, had they had multi-factor authentication turned on, they would not have. And these are big dollar incidents. Yeah. When a hacker sees that, are they, do they just, use less time there because they know it's trouble or they just leave that and go find me who doesn't have that well so there's an assumption you've made that i'm going to change which is is that a hacker is a person who is is attacking you directly and a hacker is a computer that has been programmed to look for weaknesses so it doesn't stop for bathroom breaks. It doesn't work eight hour days. It doesn't get hangovers on Monday. It just constantly goes and looks and checks all the different things. And then as it finds a weakness and then it moves on, it collects the data and then shares back to you so that you can then, if you're the bad guy, have a more concerted you know, effort right. at that place because now you found weaknesses. I use the parking lot scenario like in a mall. So you have, you drive to a mall, you lock your car. Um, you lock your car because the first thing people do is if they're walking by, they'll grab the door handle. And if it's open, they might reach in and steal your money. So you've slowed them down a little bit. You roll up your window, you know, then you lock your car. 
you also hide your, your pocketbook or your briefcase in the trunk. So you take all these steps along the way, but still somebody, if they wanted to, could potentially just break the window and get into your car. But what you're trying to do is make yourself less likely of a target so that it's not worth the effort. They'll just go somewhere else because it's easier. I like that. Um, yeah, because most of us, again, most people think nobody's coming for me for whatever reason. And, and we just need to, I love the analogy. You're less, you look less likely to be hacked or robbed. I got it. Right. And you're right. They could just walk by and yeah, put a cover on their hand, just smash the window and reach in. But, and, and again, man, people that, and we're all guilty of this to a point, leaving something on the front seat that they want to steal. And, and that kind of leads into the, into the next side of uh, security though. So we know that they can break the window at any point in time. Yep. So the next thing you need to do is you need to back up your data. Yep. You need to have insurance. So the whole concept is, is you try to make yourself not a target. You recognize that state sponsored terrorism, things like that are pretty hard to stop at our individual small level. So what's the next way to protect yourself? You back up your data so that if something happens, you can recover. And then the third step is obviously is insurance. Yeah. Um, and we love cyber insurance. Good. And are more and more people starting to buy that? They are, and and it's it's an exponential growth. And the reason we love cyber insurance is insurance companies do not like to pay money; they like to collect money, right? You get a policy with them; they're going to charge you more if your risk is higher. So one of the things insurance companies do is they make you go through a cyber checklist because what they want to do is one lower your risk as low as possible. But two, they want to understand what your risk is because your premium will match that. So why I like insurance companies is because I no longer am selling my services to anybody. I am working with somebody to try to help them reduce their insurance policy. And we match up very well with what the insurance uh, industry, all IT companies match up really well with what the insurance companies are recommending. I, I like that. I'm going to look into that too. Uh, can I, so what's the first computer you ever got on? How old were you and which one was it? You know, I'm not, a, I was not a computer kid. That was my next question. How did we get to you being a computer kid now? <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I'm trying to think. I, I can remember in the mid eighties playing like a Star Wars type of game where it's X's and O's and zeros in the whole universe you had to imagine. Um, and you would send photon missiles uh, and we would spend hours doing that. And that, um, But uh, how did I get involved in IT? Um, I had worked a couple of different jobs in my life. Uh, the Navy, um, I was a manager for IBM, ran a freight forwarding company down in, in Alabama. And I was looking for the next thing that I wanted to do. And so I decided I wanted to own a business. And I tried to figure out, you know, what business should I own? And I looked back through my career and realized that IT had always been a part of my career and that I liked that subject. So back in my Navy days, uh, when I was stationed overseas, I was involved in early, um, gosh, early 90s, big IT projects, and then working for IBM. Um, I did a lot of IT stuff with them, obviously. It was that anywhere in your family, parents, aunts, uncles, anything like that. And now does your family, what's the, uh, technology level and interest in your household these days? Yeah, no, um, small business ownership and IT definitely was not really part of my family. I have one brother who, who, who did, who does some stuff like that, but the rest, um, no, um, I stay out of my kids. <laughs> IT. I have some basic protections for them and, um, and, and just, I don't get too involved. Um, I do had done a lot with my, my parents, with my mother and my wife's parents. 
Yep. And there's a commercial about how frustrating that can be uh, doing IT with your mom or your dad. And, and I can attest that uh, um, it's better off for my technicians yeah, yeah. <laughs> to work with them than me. It's kind of like the husband teaching the wife how to play golf. That can only go bad. <laughs> You're right. Um, but yeah, so, um, but I do, but I think from our a family standpoint, we do, um, I think, understanding the risk with IT in the world has also helped them understand other broader risks in the world as well. And it's not to be scared, but it's more to be aware mm -hmm. and, and be situationally aware of your surroundings, whether it's online or if you're just downtown doing something to be situationally aware. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that. It makes perfect sense. And that probably is a benefit to their friends as well, because they probably passed on some of that knowledge. All right, so there's a couple of things in your background that just jumped out at me. One was uh, your seven years in the Navy, seven years in the Navy. Um, what got you into the Navy, and what was that decision process like? So I was um, I was in college, and I had changed degrees late. And when I graduated, I had a business degree, and I just had, couldn't really find what I wanted to do. And uh, the opportunity to go to officer candidate school came up. And I don't know, you know, I realized all my life I'd always kind of been dancing on that line of being good or being bad and never really quite getting in a lot of trouble, but always being on the edge of trouble. And so I thought that I personally thought that military would be a great opportunity for me to, uh, it sounds, I guess, worn out or contrite, but to see the world mm -hmm. and get my butt kicked a little bit. Yeah. And uh, so I uh, went to officer candidate school through New up in Newport, Rhode Island, and then uh, became a supply corps officer for, I think it was 88 to 95 active, and then another like five years of inactive duty. One of the things on your LinkedIn bio is a little place out in the ocean called Diego Garcia. And I know of that because my father-in-law uh, he's a retired Air Force colonel. He was a weather wing commander. And so they were stationed in Turkey and Germany and Japan and San Antonio and Lubbock, Texas and all that. So he's flown all over the place. But it's kind of like a small landing. I think he described it back in the day. It was a small landing strip with a barracks. <laughs> it is uh, It is in the middle of nowhere. Um it uh, is like six degrees north of the equator, directly below India. Um, you can only get there through military flights, and the island's closed off. It's owned by the British, actually. And it is a garden paradise. It is the prettiest spot I've ever been on the planet. I'd wow. go back tomorrow. Wow. Even though it's an unaccompanied tour, if, if you're a water person, um, some really neat facts about it, though, is uh, the runway is is massive. Um, it is, I think it was the only U.S. controlled runway in the southern hemisphere that could land the space shuttle. Oh. So that's how long it was, um, or it is. And so you can stand on one side of the, the runway and have somebody on the other side. And because of the heat and all that, you can't even see, you can't even see the person. But it's a it's a neat place because uh, there's a, a it's a coral atoll, and in in the center is just this big lagoon, and the lagoon is like about twelve miles wide, about three miles deep, uh, long, and about a hundred feet deep in in the in the middle of the lagoon. So if you like to sail or snorkel or scuba dive or anything like that, it's a, it's a perfect place. You you work during the week and then all weekend long, you pretty much have um, your time free. Nice. How long were you there? So you, the tour is usually one year. Okay. And uh, I basically was uh, an aviation support division officer. So I supported the P3s, which are airplanes that the military uses for submarine hunting. Um, so I supported the P3s that, that work that whole area. And so we had a huge warehouse and then supported some of the um, activity up in for Gulf War one and two up in the in the Gulf. Wow. So and Bahrain, yep. uh, Oman, 
Saudi Arabia, all the, that, that area. Wow. Uh, can I assume family and friends cannot come visit? Correct. <laughs> so it is an unaccompanied tour. Um, so, and there are some people who stay there for long periods of time and you wonder <laughs> who they're running from. Um, but it, it, um, you know, you can't just run to the Burger King or something like that. But on the other side of the coin, it, it's a very nice, I mean, it, it's a very nice facility. And, and if you like the outdoors and uh, specifically the water. Um, but the other thing that's really neat is there are like 26 different commands on this island. So between the British and the American military, there's at least one of everybody. Nice. So anybody that you can think of is, is there. How many other different countries would land jets there? Nobody. So just the U.S. and and Great Britain? Just U.S., Great Britain, and no ships are allowed to come in, and it's it's a completely private. um, Wow. I mean, we we even had ships in distress and would support them but not allow them in. Okay, by design, I'm sure. Right, because it is a military installation, yep. and it is an isolated installation by design. Yep. And so there's things that 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 they like to keep isolated there. Did you learn to appreciate any good British food while you were there? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. All right. No. All right. Uh, but you, they had enough there for you to eat, and could you fish? Could you catch fish and and cook yourself? Yeah, I, I wish I knew you were going to ask. I, I could show you a picture of me in my barracks, sitting on my couch with a fishing line through the window, fishing <laughs> in the bay or in the uh, in the in the water. Right. Yeah, so we we did we would uh, deep sea fishing was basically you get on the boat. You stop at a reef on the way out, maybe catch some strawberry grouper and whip it up. And is it sashimi? I don't know. I'm not. A, I, well, you put in a bunch of spices and eat it raw. Okay. So we'd stop at the reef and then another five minutes. And now you're in the middle of the Indian Ocean, deep sea fishing. So the, the transit time was literally, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and I caught my biggest fish that I caught was a 62 pound wahoo. Wow. And landed it before the sharks got it. Ooh, how'd that taste? So I landed it. We got it in the boat. We drove back to the dock. And before the boat was tied up, somebody had taken the fish and tossed it up on the dock where somebody was up there cleaning it, chopped it into steaks, threw it on the grill. And by the time we got the boat cleaned up, we were eating thick uh, Yahoo steaks. So it was pretty good. All right. That fed a lot of people too, huh? Yeah. So, you know, you asked me about the food. Actually, uh, the one thing on Diego that's really fascinating is it's American military, British military, Mauritians and Filipinos. Ooh. And and the reason you have that mix is there's a long political history with Mauritius, which is off of the Madagascar on ownership of the island. And so they have some of the Mauritians that live live there, but also the Filipinos support um, the, the mil- military base and some of the Filipinos and Mauritians lived on that Island for years, Ooh. decades. Okay. And they would, they would get off the Island for like a month out of every year to go visit family and stuff, but live there. And so I did eat some fabulous Filipino food. Oh yeah. Oh, good stuff. Uh, big change from Chapel Hill to Diego Garcia. Is that a fair assessment? <laughs> just, just, just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, how diehard of a Carolina fan are you? I um, I grew up with my grandfather uh, being a professor of Romance languages at Duke University. <laughs> my yeah. mother is a Duke University graduate. <laughs> As we have a bench, there's a family bench for my grandfather in the Duke Gardens for my grandfather, my grandmother. It's right in the middle of the Duke Gardens, um, one of the stone benches. Um, I grew up a huge Duke fan. And through a long, twisted tail, I ended up at Carolina, which is okay because I have two sons and now they're at State. Right. 
That being said, I am a true Carolina fan. I mean, I, I grew up liking Duke, um, always not liking State, but now I'm learning to like State. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but definitely Carolina it was the best time of my life, and, and I got a good education. Yeah. Now, you did, uh, you got your master's at Penn State. Uh, any allegiance to them these days? Yeah, I'm a big fan of Joe Paterno, and um, I think he was a good person. Um, I think that bad things sometimes happen, and we don't necessarily understand all the details behind it. Um, but, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a huge uh, Joe Paterno fan and uh, definitely root on the Lions, but my allegiance is more Carolina first. Yeah, I got you. Uh, one of the other neat things uh, in the research I was doing you serve as a rescue boat captain for the U S Olympic committee. Uh, you're still, are you still doing that? Um, no, that was actually in the Atlanta Olympics. Okay. The, the yachting venue was in Savannah and I grew up in Savannah and we were a big sailing family. So, um, I worked one of the race courses as one of the rescue boats or the during the Olympics and the U.S. trials, and um, but since then I I also I do a lot of racing and my kids do, and so we do a lot of sailing up here as well. Did you ever have to rescue a boat during the Atlanta Olympics? Yes, there's a couple. There's two interesting stories with that, which is one back then with the Olympics. Every country has a couple of uh, slots that are available for their boats. So what you end up with is the top uh, competitors are fabulous, but then you have other countries that maybe don't have as much sailing, maybe they're landlocked and they still have a spot. And so some of the sailors fill in or, and use those spots as well. So what you end up with is a, a, kind of a two level fleet, which is the top, which are the best in the world. And then the, the next set comes through, uh, you have some people that, that are great, but not necessarily as good. So it would always end up very entertaining around the weather mark um, uh, when the, the boats were coming around. But during the US trials, we had really bad stormy weather and we were out in the ocean just a couple miles offshore. And uh, my buddy and I looked up and the clouds above us were green and the Ooh. sky was just kind of going in a circle. Ooh. And uh, I did not know this, but uh, what the, the sailors all did and was really smart is they took all their boats and they just flipped them upside down. And we tied one boat to the next to the next. And then basically I just kept pulling the boats through the water real slowly, you know, to keep everybody in line, but and just weather out the storm. That way, instead of having a sailboat flopping around and getting damaged, you just flip it upside down, and then you just sit on top of the boat upside down until the storm passes. Wow, that had to be a little. That had to have been a little tense for a while, huh? Yeah, it's pretty pretty neat. Saying everybody made it through, okay? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because I said these these folks are you know Olympic sailors hmm. at the upper level, and, and and you 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 definitely learn a lot from them. Now, for the boats that weren't at the elite level, what happens to them or what do they do that requires a rescue boat captain to come rescue them? Well, um, mostly it's just the, the rules of the road when you're sailing and, and boats coming from one direction or another and, and you have equipment breaking or you have collisions or once again, you just have bad weather. And if you're not comfortable in really heavy air, uh, it, you, you just get overwhelmed and then you really get exhausted. And that's what happens is, is that it's kind of like snow skiing. You know, the first day you go snow skiing, you're exhausted. And part of the reason is, is because you've fallen a hundred times and you've had to get up. But by, uh, the next few times you go, you're not nearly as tired, even though you're skiing a lot more. And the sailing is the same way. You know, when you're first learning, you get overpowered and it wears you out. And then, and then bad things can happen. And so, you know, that's, that's the types of rescues is, is just people getting just tired or a boat breaking down or a collision. Did you ever have dreams of being an Olympic sailor for the United States? No, I do have a couple of friends that had 
that had uh, mounted campaigns and got awfully close. Uh, and an older brother who I always thought should have, uh, okay. but he never did. He, he chose other things. Is that an expensive sport to be in? It, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. So here in Wilmington, we are growing high school sailing and high school sailing. The, the yacht clubs provide the boats. And when you go to a regatta, wherever you go, the boats are provided for you. Wow. And so you don't have to be a small boat owner. You just have to be somebody who swims and who wants to learn to sail. And so we are growing the high school programming here in Wilmington. Um, right now we have, I think, nine high schools represented, over 50 kids in our program. And we practice as a team. And then when we go to regattas, they, uh, they obviously they sail against each other uh, because of a team is a high school. So uh, the way high school and college sailing works is you sail for your school. And um, so, yeah, we can, we can get kids in relatively cheaper, especially if you consider some of the higher level um, travel clubs for soccer or baseball or football and, and the thousands of dollars that you pay, uh, sailing doesn't have to be that bad. Um. How many people on a boat for these teams? And is it predominantly male? No. So, so you basically have single-handed boats and then you have double-handed boats and then triple-handed boats. And most common for the high school and the college is the double-handed. And it is absolutely 100% co-ed. Um, and it, it all has to do with body weight. So if you're weight conscious, that's not, it's not a good sport because we talk about each other's <laughs> weight without any kind of impact, because if it's blowing, you want the heavy person. If it's really light, you want the light person. It's uh, nothing personal. It's, yeah. it's just, it's competition. Um, and so that's kind of neat because of our high school programming has 50% girls guys ratio. Good. And it's all, um, they, they're good kids, you know, uh, sailors, sailors learn a lot about uh, uh, a life. I, when you're learning to sail, um, one, uh, making the machine work is, is very challenging because there's so many different things you can do. Two, you, you're weather aware. Three, you care about the environment because you know, you're in the water and you don't want to be swimming in polluted water. Um, and so there's a whole set of things that, that sailing does for, for the kids. And then on top of that, all the STEM programs. And so we're beginning to try to figure out ways with the middle schools to bring the STEM type of programming and expose more people to sailing. Um, my goal is sailing for pleasure. So my kids race, but I'm not trying to create Olympians as we were talking about before. What we're trying to create is a lifestyle of where you go sailing go on a full moon. You know, there. We're in the re lakes region, you know, Jordan Lake um, uh, and, and other lakes. You know, we go sailing at night here in the river on a full moon, on a full moon. Nice. And, you know, there's nothing more fun than a quiet sail on a high tide, a full moon. Not so, a lot of yeah. traffic. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Uh, if I take Diego Garcia out of the picture, where's the best water you've been in? Water to do what? Whatever you want to do, man. What's prettiest, most, you know, temperature-wise, whatever it is, the scenery. That's that's a that's a great question. Um, I think uh, the the Virgin Islands. Okay. We've we've sailed in the Virgin Islands, uh, bareboated around the various islands, and that that's a lot of fun because it's clear water. The people are super nice, uh, and uh, it's just it's a good it's a good family spot to go. How far up and down the East Coast have you gone sailing? Through the Navy combined, uh, all the way through Quebec City and through up and up and down and then all the way down the coast and then all the way to Cuba, to uh, Puerto Rico and somewhere close into South America. Wow. How about casually sailing? Uh, all over the Caribbean, mostly. And then just, uh, but even around here, there's really nice sailing. I mean, 
you can go into Chesapeake Bay as an example and and go for three or four days and it's a blast. Wow. Um, because of it's really not about going somewhere. It's about just enjoying uh, a leisurely pace. And sometimes it's very leisurely and you are in shorts and drinking a beer and your feet kicked up. And other days you got a life jacket on yeah. and a rain, you know, and a raincoat over that and you're cold. Um, and I think that's the fun part of sailing is, is that it's always something different. I see a discovery channel show in your future with all these things you do, right? <laughs> You'd enjoy that, huh? Sure. I, definitely, definitely the water. Um, it, it definitely, my blood ebbs and flows, and I'm very happy that I see it in both my sons now that they, um, they're water kids. Uh, so they both work during the summer as dock masters and sailing instructors and oh, cool. things like that. Are you a, uh, do you scuba dive and all that other water related stuff? I used to. Okay. Yep. And so, um, I used to, used to dive and part of that was that uh, uh, on my way to Diego Garcia, my wife and I decided since I was getting a free trip to Diego Garcia, that we would take a trip to Australia. Ooh. So we took a trip to Australia. <laughs> and if you're going to Australia, you got to go to the Barrier Reef. So yeah. that's when we learned to dive. And so that was our very first spot diving was on the Barrier Reef. And I'll say it's not the prettiest. Really? Yeah. I mean, the prettiest place to dive in the world is the place where nobody is because wildlife is scared of people uh, okay. and traffic. So if you go to a place where a lot of people are scuba diving, you see a lot of the things that they want you to see. But if you go to a place where nobody's around and are just quiet, you see three times as much because you just kind of see the world as it, as it goes. Nice. So that trip to Australia earned you husband of the year points, I'm assuming. At the time, I think it was boyfriend <laughs> of the year. <laughs> hey, it led to, yeah. led to marriage, right? Yeah. So it was a very expensive trip to save a few thousand, uh, to save a little <laughs> bit of money because of, uh, uh, they were flying us over, but yeah, so it was, it was kind of neat. Australia is a fascinating place. Oh yeah. You'll, will you go back again? I would. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know if I will, but I, I yeah. definitely. Uh, it was fabulous. Nice. Uh, all right. So David Usher with CMIT Solutions of Wilmington. Uh, before we go, give us now when the show's over and people think about it, they process what you were talking about early on in the show. What's one thing they can go look for or look at to see what kind of protection they have, correct backup, anything like that? Something simple and easy for them to look for. Yeah. So. Um, we, we talked about a couple of different things in security. And so I'll, I'll throw out something slightly different, which is sit back and go look at your computer and imagine it being tossed or stolen. Just imagine it being gone and think to yourself, would that impact me or would it just annoy me for the day because I had to run to Best Buy and buy mm -hmm. another laptop? And the goal should be that it just annoys you, not that it creates some sort of problem for your business. So, you know, um, how do you, how are you storing your data is, is, is a great question. Like, do you run QuickBooks to run your, uh, to run your financials for your data? Are you backing up your QuickBooks? Yep. Or so, so that's really probably the biggest thing is just to imagine that what would happen if your computer was gone or um, somebody all of a sudden said, you can't access any of your data. So you, you have a screen that pops up that says, um, pay us bitcoins or you're not going to get your data back. Okay. And, I like and that. If you, if you can come up with, uh, you know what, that would really stink. But if they said that, I would just do X, Y, and Z. Then you know you're in a fairly good place. All right. We've been putting your no David's number up on the screen here during the show. Uh, folks, it's worth a phone call. I promise you. Most of us are not doing anywhere near what we need to do. And especially if you own a business and you need to protect that, if you have financial data, if you have employee data, anything like that. So please give David a call. Uh, just make sure your stuff's good and protected. David, we appreciate all the tips today because your world is changing by the hour, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Uh, there, there's, 
there's threats that are that come out every day and the the secret is to try to figure out how not to have to react and not so just as a perfect example yahoo announced a breach you know a year or two ago whatever and everybody freaked out i didn't why didn't i freak out because i didn't care and i didn't care because my passwords were already stored in a password manager and they were separate my yahoo one password was only for my yahoo mm. i had practiced good hygiene and i'd been changing my password occasionally so um, the whole concept is is it is a constantly evolving threat and in order to be able to sleep at night you just have to have yourself in a position so you don't you know you're aware of what's going on but the, every every new thing that comes up doesn't cause you great heartache and i guess it's kind of like invest right mm -hmm. you know the market goes up and down but if you've got yourself set up correctly you can ignore the fact every you're aware of what's going on but you can ignore the fact that every day there's a dip or a, or, a, or a spike because if you've got you've got yourself in a position yeah okay. and that was the first and only analogy that came to my head when you're talking about that is planning for it so uh wonderful stuff david if you love the stories uh diego garcia just the, the the places i've never been to that's why i love doing this show because i hear stuff and learn about that and seriously though good luck with the high school program and the stem program to the middle schools love that and i know that gives you great joy as you see that grow thank you yep and so uh again reach out to david on his phone number uh make sure your stuff's all in good shape and we will see everybody next time on triangle bni tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.